Hey folks, uh, welcome to Don't Take Out Your Phone. Today I had a really cool chat with a friend of mine called Tanji Morgan, who is a special advisor at the Bank of England, a mentor, and uh, does a bunch of other things too. We talked about the future of work, we talked about automation, algorithms, AI, tech, financial services, all of that stuff. So we covered a lot. Um, really, really uh, great to listen to her views and I hope you enjoy it. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. And we're live. Thank you, Tanji, for joining me on the podcast. Great. We've had um, so many awesome chats and we should have probably recorded all of them. Um, but yeah, I wanted to have a chat with you, given what you do and, and all that stuff. Um, I thought we could have a good chat about where life and the planet and everything's okay, going. Yeah, yeah. Great. yeah. Great. So uh, yeah, so what's your background? Well, um, I guess I'll give you the short version. Yeah. Uh, for the last over 30 years, I've been in the global reinsurance uh, insurance arena, working in the US, Bermuda, London, and international markets. And about three years ago, I um, was doing a transitioning career and looking to do more, I guess you say, non-exec advisory work um, after leaving an executive career. I was appointed by the Bank of England's Prudential Regulation Authority awesome. to come in as a senior advisor. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that has been awesome. It's interesting because six months after my appointment, we had the, uh, the Brexit vote and all the uh, things yeah. that we know. So from a regulatory standpoint, from the central bank standpoint, there has been a lot of focus, obviously, on uh, the transition and, and the effects on the financial services sector, which is a huge part of GDP, as we know, for the UK. But over and above that, I'm also a senior advisor to Strategia Worldwide, which is um, an organization founded by Sir Richard Sheriff and Ian Pickard, a couple of years back to address the um, risk management, uh, looking at various businesses, mostly extractive industries in okay. Africa and some of the um, emerging economies, and looking at risk management, looking holistically across the piece from a societal, a technological um, you know, sustainability perspective, and how do you work with boards to understand uh, the upside and downside risk. So Amazing. technology, however, has become more and more to the center of a lot of the business models um, and looking at profitability, looking at how do you attract uh, new talent. And this has become very much a part of major discussions around board well, tables. For both of the things you've been doing. For both of the things that I've been doing, yeah. as well as I'm also a mentor at uh, Techstars Barclays Accelerator, which oh. Techstars is a very large global VC that focuses on fintechs uh, globally. Is that UK based? It is US based. US based. Okay. However, in Tel Aviv, in London, and in New York, they co partner with Barclays Bank. Oh, amazing. And basically, what occurs is there are uh, applications that come in from around the world. And they go through a vetting process, and ultimately, there are 10 startups that go into this accelerator for uh, 13 weeks. And during that time, we have various mentors, you have various training in order to get them prepared to, uh, you know, seek more capital. Uh, okay, and right. it's uh, it's really exciting. So they let come in with an idea. Exactly. They then... come in with an idea. Some are at various stages. Some are early along in the process where you can start to help them craft their story, help them target market, um, you know, refine the pitch, if you will. Yeah, yeah. And then others may be at the latter stages where they are looking to uh, develop relationships that the mentors may have in order to get them uh, more capital uh, and, and actually be able to scale up. Amazing. And are these typically young people well, that, that have got some crazy idea to revolutionize something. No, you know, I, I, I was really amazed. My first year uh, getting involved with Techstars um, Barclays 
was last year. And what struck me, just like you, I assumed that I was going to walk up to Rise uh, offices in the shortage, and there were going to be all of these, you know, young kids in sandals and jeans and <laughs> yeah. whatever, you know, uh, walking in with these outlandish ideas. But actually, what I found, I would say, um, probably about fifty percent of the folks that are operating in these businesses are probably a mid to some are say. 30 and above, All and right. then you have some that are older. You have people that might very similar be like me, who've had executive careers in financial services and now are looking to do something different. And what you find, so, so the age is very. Right, okay, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, and what you do tend to find is a lot of the um, startups that are in the accelerator the CEOs and CFOs and, and um, founders have actually worked in the banking sector or the uh, insurance right. sector, but more so in if the they're doing fin- like a fin- If they're doing a fintech. Exactly. Right. And so what they have come away with are seeing better ways, more efficient ways in order to address issues that they saw in their day-to-day work. Okay. okay. Right. Um, so... They, for instance, are looking at um, operational resiliency. You know, how do you begin to look at the risks that you take on from uh, technology and um, your business planning and wanting to have 24-7 access by your customer base? What are the risks associated with that and how do you integrate that into the overall business planning? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And so, and so, why are they coming to the um to the the, the boot camps? Is that what you? Well, I, I guess the... I don't know that I would necessarily call them boot camps, but maybe you could say that there are a lot of uh, iterations of boot camp tech, yeah, uh, yeah. startup, accelerator, incubator. Yeah, there's so many things. names around yeah. it. There's so many names, but basically, the way I say is that this particular um, the way this particular accelerator, if you will, is structured is that you have three mentor days. And so various people such as me, um, people from the cabinet office, people that are in banking, people in consultancy, private equity, uh, investors themselves decide to, um, if you will, volunteer their time and their expertise to this group of firms that are in uh, the the accelerator for that time. Great. So we get to learn from them. They get to learn from us. And in actual fact, there have been a few mentors that have actually left their day job and gone to work oh, wow. with some of the oh, with wow. some of the fintechs. You know, <laughs> yeah. so who knows? You may have me coming saying I'm working for the latest fintech. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who knows? I mean, no, but brilliant. it but it yeah. really is exciting. Um, is it really a creative environment? Is it? It's a creative environment. It's one where, of course, it's open space and you have the different breakout areas, yeah, yeah. Um, the coffee shops and all the usual things that one would expect. But what I found interesting also is that I leave my office uh, in a city, you know, bank to traditional, station, bank traditional yeah. uh, and you walk less than 10 minutes and you're in a totally different environment yeah, 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 yeah. and uh, it's like it's like superman you were like clark Kent, and you need to get the glasses off exactly, take the suit off and exactly then... i mean when i walked in the first time i went up there i had i left the office and of course i was suited and booted as we say <laughs> yeah. and when i walked in i totally felt overdressed you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but um but it's a really really uh, neat environment i like the buzz i like the vibe yeah, yeah. um people are really interested in hearing from someone like me who has had a varied uh, career and um, it really is fulfilling to me after having a career of 30 plus years and being able to impart some of the um, I guess some of the knowledge some of the experiences that I've uh, amassed over the years and and actually see where it's helping folks no I think it's great just on back on to the on dress mm-hmm. Which is interesting. I've been having a. I was speaking to my friend yeah, only yesterday about dress codes. Mm-hmm. And when I started working in the city, which is about fifteen or sixteen years ago, after a prior career in fashion and stuff, um, it was always like suit, tie, top button done up. Otherwise, you would never get through the door. Yeah. Um, but now I'm finding 
you know, I went to see a chairman for an insurance company the other day and, and my, my, my shirt collar was like slightly too tight because either it had shrunk or my neck had got bigger <laughs> and I had my tie on and I was feeling really uncomfortable. And, you know, if you're not feeling comfortable, you're not going to be your best. So I, I was like debating and I thought, right, I'm getting rid of the tie. And I turned up and he was in jeans and a T-shirt. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, just been thinking a lot about, you know, um, how dress has changed. And also, you know, the fintechs being in Shoreditch, you know, which are financial technology right. firms and finance firms, and they're all, you know, they're dressing casual. Goldman's have scrapped their dress codes. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. Have you seen it also changing? Well, I think that I must um, I must come, come clean here. I am of a certain age, and um, <laughs> I do feel more comfortable, if you will, um, being in a more traditional dress. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that it is really the tone from the top with regards to dress and with regards to organizations. So your particular situation, you went to that meeting and the CEO was dressed casual. Now, um, that was that only the particular Friday or Monday or did they have a dress code that had been relaxed for various reasons? The question would be, with that CEO, when he goes to his board meeting, okay, with his investors and with his chairman, uh, would he go in in a T-shirt and jeans? I would tend to say probably not. Do you know, you're probably right, but it's interesting because you see a lot <clears throat> with social media now. I don't, I, you page your Instagram and um, there's a lot of motivational stuff um, and uh, and there's some amazing things. And, and really the, the, a big message at the moment is like, don't be the same as everyone else. Correct. You know, and there's a good guy, I'm reading his book at the moment called David Goggins, mm-hmm. um, a really cool American guy. And his little quote is, be uncommon amongst uncommon people. And, and you want to stand out. I, I understand wanting to stand out. I understand individuality. I understand the term bring your whole self to work and all of this. However, I, I still go with the, I still come from the standpoint of you need to get in the room first. Yeah, okay? yeah, 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 yeah. And so I would not encourage um, a young applicant, college grad, or whomever that's seeking a job in perhaps financial services in a more traditional inner city to rock up for their interview um, being themselves in t-shirts and jeans, okay? Yeah, yeah, I would yeah. suggest that they should go more traditional, okay, uh, because you want to be yourself and you want to bring your whole self and be different. However, you don't want your... Um, different attire or I don't know let's just keep with attire to actually distract from you getting the opportunity to sit in front of the HR director to sit in front of whomever you need to sit in front of now once you're in and once you understand the the culture and the dynamics and the lay of the land uh, you know, then I think that there is um, room for you to express yourself. Um, but with once again, within the the culture of the business that you're working in. OK. Um, and once again, I come at this from being someone who's over 50 and um, my take on attire and um you know, basically how you interact within the office yeah. uh, business. Uh, situations may be slightly different and maybe a bit au fait. I will put my hands up for that. But I, we must remember that people that are of my age and older are people that are still in the senior level roles. Absolutely. Okay. No, no, you're right. Yeah. yeah, you're right. It's kind of like get along before you can get on. You know, this is correct. Yeah. You've got to get in the room. First. You've got to get in the room. <laughs> and you've got to dress appropriately for the, for the, the meeting or the interview or correct. whatever you're doing. Correct. For sure. For sure. Correct. No, no I, I completely agree with that. I, j- I just think now it's got um, it's uh, it used to be very clear cut. Correct. And now it's a little bit gray. But, you know, it's interesting because I can remember when I was in, in uh, New York still before I came to London. And this was during the time of the the fin, um, the um, technology bubble. You know, um, I, yeah, yeah. Um, dot com bubble. Dot yeah. com bubble. And so there was a thing where I tell you, in the morning sometimes when I was going to work, you would see the, the Wall Street bankers and, and folks. Oh, my goodness. They looked like they just rolled out of bed. <laughs> I mean, they barely had combed their hair. They... 
they were in scruffy t-shirts looking like my goodness but they were you know making a lot of money and they were going to wall street and actually there was um a lot of talk around the fact that uh, companies such as Brooks Brothers and Joseph A. Bank, I don't know if you, you're familiar with Joseph Bank, but it was sort of the Brooks Brothers right, right. Of, uh, of the U.S., they actually had a drop in their sales because, wow. you know, bankers were not coming in and buying the, the suits and the ties and everything because it was it was almost a race to see who could be the scruffiest, <laughs> you know, and that was a badge of honor. Okay. And then after um, you that. know the dot com bubble and, and things began to turn somewhat, you started to see the dress go back to the very much uh, you know super smart super yeah. smart ties, button down, whatever. Your tailor, you know. Yeah. So I found that to be quite interesting. Of course that was you know, over you know fifteen, twenty years ago. So we have we have really changed. I mean, technology and the fintechs and the startups and things that, that uh, we know have really changed the dial on that. So um, perhaps we might not see anything as dramatic as that. But, but who knows? I mean, fashion interested. fashion comes and goes, right? Correct. I mean, you know, some people love being smart. It's nice. You feel great in a good suit. You know, you feel like a million dollars. and um, But then it's, it just seems at the moment there's a little wave. I think even Goldman's have scrapped their dress code. Yes. And once again, it is... It's really the tone from the top. If people are uh, empowered and it's not just something that is said, a platitude, but it's yeah, actually yeah. demonstrated amongst the senior management and senior leadership, um, I think that that makes a big difference. Yes. Yeah, no, that's true. Mm-hmm. Apart from apart from dress and stuff, from your position at the bank, have you seen any other uh, any other interesting trends that are affecting the future of how we're working and well, I think not only from from the bank, but just in dealing with um, the the fintechs, the startups that, yeah, that we've yeah. discussed, and just um, other observations that I've had amongst the the business market, what you're seeing is and what you're hearing about. I was just at uh, Mansion House the other evening for the um, international bankers. Um, dinner that they have oh, and there was a there was a speech and and it's one that you hear over and over again the terms such as uh diversity inclusion the terms of um attracting new talent how do you attract new talent into the business how do you upskill your workers that are currently in work and how do you begin to basically give the employee the same type of experience with regards to their relationship with technology as they have in their private life into their work life yeah, because yeah. we see a blurring of the lines. So basically what we are seeing more and more of is uh, flexible working, people, um, you know, returners, women perhaps that have left the workforce to have children. They're now looking to come back into the workforce. There's an integration program for them. We are looking at uh, well-being, mental health, and things of that nature, and also appreciating the fact, similar to what we've just been talking about, how do you make uh, create an environment in very traditional businesses such as the central bank or or insurance, Lloyd's of London and all the places that we know, how do you make those places more appealing to the younger talent that is coming in and that will be needed? How do you actually entice someone that is just coming out of university to want to come and work in a more traditional environment rather than go to work for Google or Facebook or go to a startup. Well, well there's an issue. I, I met a, f- a founder of a fintech recently, and he, he he showed me this graph, which was really interesting. And then on, along one axis, it's like the, the, the complexity of the problem that the particular industry is trying to solve. Mm-hmm. And then up the top is how cool the industry is. Mm-hmm. And people want to work for the coolest industries with the biggest problems to solve, yeah. right? So Tesla, Google, Facebook, et cetera. And then if you look at financial services, really, really interesting problems to solve. You know, insurance, you know, really keeps the economy moving and stuff, but it's not cool. No. And so and so, and so that's the problem. You know, you have uh, amazing it's bright, an image issue. It's an image, yeah. 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 And and you you really hit something that, that is quite um, noticeable 
Okay, um, as I'm telling you, you know, folks in the city are talking about, you know, how do we attract new talent? Uh, Vision 2030 that has just been uh, completed by the bank, it will be socialized at some point, but it's really looking at um, how will the central bank look in 2030? And that would, um, a large focus of that, quite frankly, uh, is around the talent talent retention right, and once right. again bringing in the data scientists bringing in you know making um you know the financial services sector be it insurance banking investment banking making it look cool yeah, um, yeah, yeah. because there are a lot of issues that quite frankly are big issues that uh, whether you like it or not financial services are there there are safety nets um insurance is there you know, for protection. Uh, you yeah. know, if you have a loss, if you sustain some sort of injury, there is a safety net. You know, there is a um, you can be made whole again. Um, you know, when you look at banking and finance, we still are in a world where you need money. You know, for sure, yeah. The economy, you need jobs and things of that nature. So we do have an image issue, and I think that um, more and more you will continue to hear the concerns about how do you um, change the image, how do you make the, the traditional financial services cool. What you're finding is that this um, an ecosystem is being developed wherein you have the fintechs, the insurer techs, and people operating um, outside of, if you will, the regulatory yeah. environment, yeah. you know, the peer-to-peer, -peer, the crowdfunding, things of that nature. Yeah. So actually, if you think about it, they're really trying to solve some of the same issues in a way, but but in a different in a different um, if you will environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's not outside of the the traditional yeah. institutional. You do have a lot. Yeah, it's interesting because I mean, like with with debt, for example, a lot of private equity firms and and private individuals and family offices are doing private debt. Yes. You know, filling the gap that the banks have been unbeen able not been able to lend from. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting, but again, it just goes back to what you were saying. It comes from the top. Yeah. And you see the the major financial services firms, people like people like themselves, mm -hmm. yes. and they're hiring similar people from similar firms to do similar jobs, and that people don't seem to want to take a risk on someone who's slightly left field or. And this this is um, also another issue that I think traditional institutions and and if you will. Uh, the regulators and things uh, really need to take into account because you, while you do want to have qualified and experienced people that are leading your organizations on your board, um, in your senior leadership, there is something to be said about we do uh, tend to to bring on people to hire people that are similar to us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so while you can understand that to a certain extent, you know, they, they fit the mold, they are not going to be disruptive, they're not going to uh, basically upset the apple cart too much. Yeah. But what you actually have to also understand is this thing called technology and this thing about, well, I may have been in the business for 30 or 40 years and I may be the bee's knees, if you will. However, how comfortable am I with uh, doing a podcast or yeah. how comfortable am I using an iPad versus having my board papers. Okay. Yeah. And actually more importantly, do I understand how technology is coming more and more to the center of my business model? Okay. than previously it might have been, uh, you know, technology from, moving from old legacy systems to new systems, moving, uh, if you have M&A um, uh, activities going on, how are you bolting on the various legacy systems yeah, in order yeah. to join it up? Um, what kind of technology are you implementing within the business, not just for cost savings or to cut expenses by getting AI or getting machine learning? Yeah, you yeah. have to appreciate what, um, the pros and the cons are of that and what's most appropriate for your organization. And then you have to add on the fact that we have now have a customer base that is um, not necessarily waiting on us, the traditional institutions, to tell them what they need or to tell them this is the product you need or 
this is how you should behave, react. You got the customer now saying, telling us what they want. So you got all of these things yeah, going yeah. on. You got internal technology. You got external technology. You got AI. You got algorithms and algorithms and things of that nature that are all in the mix, that are very much becoming more central yeah, to yeah. Uh, the business models. And I would argue for not only financial, uh, the financial services sector, but for education, for healthcare. I mean, it, it be, that that technology and that change uh, across the piece is really why we need to think differently about who we have at the top table. How do we incorporate someone that is technology savvy that might not look like us, um, might not talk like us, but very much understand, you know, the, the what I'm talking about, what I've just... And, and, are, and are you seeing that people at the top table at the moment are embracing technology and they're, they're interested in learning about how these new things are working and they've got this growth of mindset and or, or, or you're seeing more, you know, well, look, we've been doing this like this for, you know, 30 years and it's been great and, you know, why are we going to check, you know? I think it runs the gamut. Uh, quite frankly, you see some boards, and these are my opinions from my work and observations, um, you see some boards that are very much entrenched in this is what we do. Um, we are concerned about shareholder value. We're concerned about paying dividends. You know, we are uh, concerned about um, ROE. And so the technology piece doesn't necessarily play front and center. Okay? Right. Yeah. Um, then you see others that are more open to it, perhaps because, unfortunately, they may have had a cyber hack or they may have yeah. had some outage of their operations. And so it does then become a topic. OK, and there's a concern and there is more um, discussion around sustainability and operational resiliency and things of that nature. Um, but you tend to still see, in my opinion, you tend to still see if it's technology, it's an IT issue. OK. And yeah, we yeah, have yeah. a CTO or we have a CDO and, and, and they're going to handle that. Um, so I am still, and once again, it varies by industry sector, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. but I'm still seeing, um, uh, pretty much the technology piece is not front and center, which I find interesting because if you take it to cyber, which everyone talks about, um, I think I heard the other day that 51% of CEOs have a concern about cyber. It is a, it is a key risk, uh, hacking and things of that nature, but, um, of course, in the U.S., we have seen um, a heck of a lot more uptake in cyber uh, insurance and uh, liability okay. and things of that nature than you have um, outside of the U.S. Interesting. However, uh, with GDPR and things of that nature uh, in train now, we may look, you know, we may see more of an uptake. But in reality, it's it's a risk. It's considered. It's discussed. Um, but how are firms actually addressing it? Yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it seems to be sort of a thing. It's, it's not going to happen to us. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Until it happens. For sure. <laughs> what I have seen recently is a real up, um, uptick in, in like the chief digital officer yes, role, yeah, yeah. which, you know, five, ten years ago never existed. Correct. And so that's been quite interesting. Yeah, the, the chief digital officer, the chief technical officer, you know, whatever... <coughs> Uh, terminology name you want to give it. It's great to see that. Um, however, the other side of that is, are they actually at board level? Are they sitting on the board? Are they sitting yeah. around the table? Okay. Or are they um, brought in at certain points, you know, when, yeah. when there's an IT issue or, or digital issue? Um, a lot of them are doing great work. Um, they are actually project managing, if, if it will, a lot of um, data transformation yeah, programs yeah. within the businesses. And, of course, they are cited, um, have citing because of the financial implications, you know, investments and, and uh, bringing on temporary staff and things of that nature for, from a cost perspective. And, of course, there are cost benefit analysis that are done and all of that. So I do... Um, I am really pleased to see, as you say, that we're seeing more CTOs and CDOs. Um, but once again, 
how are they, have they been able to move the dial and move the discussion at the top table? Yeah, yeah. And, and that will continue to be the challenge for a while, I believe. That's true. That's true. I, I, there's probably not many in financial services firms that are on board. Um, in other industries, other sectors, mm -hmm. they are starting to. Yes. Um, so as financial services, again, catches up. Catches up, correct. Um, you'll start to see that because ultimately financial services firms are tech firms with customer services attached. Well, it's interesting yeah. you say that because um, I think it was Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan a couple of years ago, there was a statement made by both stating that they were not banks. They were right. technology companies. <laughs> and um, I am to understand that uh, J.P. Morgan, in one of their areas, I think maybe asset management, they are actually requiring their staff to take coding oh, wow. uh, lessons. So um, that, I found, is quite interesting. That's great. I love but quite frankly, I do um, argue that most companies in many sectors, okay, are becoming more technology companies that sell goods and services around the technology, which is why to the earlier point that I made where you see technology not just being the back office or um, about the phone systems or things of that nature, it is really becoming more central to the business uh, proposition that businesses have. And so yeah. this is why people like the CTOs and CDOs really need to have a voice at the table. Yeah, and also how the firms run correct you know how, your your experience as an employee and correct your daily activity yeah that's really interesting have you have you seen much impact from ai yet in financial services from my um from my standpoint what i am seeing is a lot of proof of concepts um where in some of the the fintechs that we've earlier spoken about or insure techs um ed techs if you will are uh, coming in and doing POCs. They have an idea where they can uh, provide a solution, give more efficiency to operations that are being done. And so there are a lot of POCs that are being done in the market. Yeah. Um, so from that perspective, AI machine learning yeah. is um, being looked at. Okay. Um, but once again, what I see is that AI or more, um, correctly machine learning yeah, algorithms. Um, is, is, is being used to address a specific issue in the firm. It's not necessarily holistic and how can it not only address one specific issue but have more applicability or be scaled up throughout the firm. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so that's what we're seeing. We're seeing um, obviously algorithms being used in ETFs and, and things of that nature. Yeah. Um, so there is an acknowledgement. Once again, some firms are further along the spectrum than others. Yeah. yeah but yeah. you are seeing um, integration of machine learning. Yeah. Um, what, going I on. what I yeah. found really interesting is, is you know, everyone, you speak to someone and, and everyone's like, oh, you, you don't know me as well as I know myself. Mm -hmm. And there's this like self thing of, you know, how can you possibly know me better than I know myself? Mm -hmm. What's interesting is, um, is algorithms probably do know you better than you know yourself. You know, you have like, so Google are recording a lot of stuff, right? Um, I don't know, but I go on my social media feed and it's super tailored to something I've spoken to my mate about because they have access to your microphone, they know my habits. I mean, I mean, literally, you know, you could argue that in a very short space of time, they will know you better than, they, than you know yourself. And therefore, with you know, insur insurance products, um, health care, all of this kind of stuff, um, it's going to be amazing. I mean, you know, algorithms are going to be infiltrating every single part of our lives, of businesses, um, they'll be much more efficient than humans. And I find that very, very uh, interesting because, you know, on one side it's like super scary. Like, how can that computer know me better than I know myself? How can it predict that I'm going to, you know, do this or I want to buy this or, you know, on the other side, it's quite cool. I mean, I have a different view on that. Um, Quite frankly, as you well know, we've talked about this, I speak a lot on algorithmic bias. 
and the lack of diversity, if you will. Um, we all know that the majority of coders, quite frankly, are young white guys that are sitting in Silicon Valley or various places, and they are coding. Um, we have seen and continue to see um, different, um, I, I guess you'd say anomalies maybe, or different um, outputs that are discriminatory against certain uh, populations, against women. Um, it, it, it's, it's interesting that the machine, just because it's machine, doesn't mean that it is neutral. Okay, and where I'm going with this is, yes, I agree that we are being monitored consistently. Our iPhones are tracking us. Um, people have nest in their homes and, and we technology is all around us. Okay, um, however, we cannot um, overlook the fact that there are um, biased data sets. There are biased um if you will, parameters or, or linkages that may be in play because the machines that are learning off of themselves, and yes, you could say, well, Tangie, they're taking my data. So how biased could that be? Well, it is informing you. It is tracking you. It is, it is affecting your behavior. It is having an effect that may seem on the surface that it's great, it's, it's comfortable, it's cool that when I sign on, it knows that I want to go here or it can tell me this and all that. And I'm not saying that technology and the algorithms and the benefits that it gives us are all wrong or bad, okay? But I think that we should also appreciate the fact that um, they do not necessarily provide context. And it and has been said over and over again that machines cannot be, you know, they they will not be human. There is something about the neural um, networks that we have in our brain that can't be mimicked by the neural networks and yet. technology. Yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe in uh, I don't I don't I don't disagree. I mean, I think I was I was just saying off, off, uh, offline. I'm reading. Uh, well, I'm listening. I'm doing an audio book, um, and I did uh, *Sapiens*. I'm just listening to *Homo Deus* by Yuval mm -hmm. uh, Harari, and uh, and he's a humanist. So right. you know, he believes that we're just algorithms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and as you know, machine learning and the algorithms that we're designing improve. Um, ultimately, it's going to be better than us, and and that's the. Uh, scary or yeah. exciting thing. I mean, but I mean, from what you're from what you're talking about, I mean, for sure, we have to be, you know, very careful with who's developing them, how they're developed, and 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 what they're being used for. Right. Um, but there's something like uh, I think Google are doing a project with, um, I think it's a healthcare or financial services firm. But mm -hmm. you can imagine how much info Google have on us, mm -hmm. and and you accept that they're able to track your data and you're given permission and you're ticking all these boxes. You've but got no really idea. Give them permission. What is informed consent? Do no we idea. Really give them permission. Okay. So now with GDPR, everyone when you click on every website, it's it's really annoying. It's so now. annoying that you <laughs> yeah. have to click yes, click, click, and, click. Yeah. How many times have you actually printed out and read the thirty plus pages of what's there? How do have you really understood that in on some uh, websites it states that they have the right to monitor uh, your activities online? so many uh, hours before you actually come to their website and so many hours after. I mean, we are actually just giving away our data. And some of it, you may say, Tangie, so what? I don't care. It's for the greater good. Uh, you know, people know that I'm exceeding the speed limit or people know, you know, uh, that I, uh, my driver's license are out of, uh, you know, past due or yeah, expired. Yeah. So, I mean, there are certain benefits to, to the technology and your data being used for the greater good. But, you know, I do believe that um, there is something to be said about understanding where the data is being used, how it's being used, and the consumer themselves needs to have a clearer understanding of that. And that is why um, a lot of 
people are now um, talking uh, towards or, or putting the idea out to have a um, a data regulator, you know, um, some yes. sort of governance yeah. over the regulation and how, how things um, are being used. But to get back to your point about algorithmic bias, discrimination, well, Google itself, um, back in 2015, was had to offer an apology because um, one of their black employees, when his doing facial recognition, equated him to um, an ape. OK. Wow. And quite frankly, if you go and you Google, you know, beautiful babies, you will have to go a long way down the the um, the pictures uh, before you find, uh, you know, a brown baby. OK, because I mean, so these are things that are, are occurring. Now, yeah, I'm not saying yeah. that people are sitting in a room and actually looking to discriminate or there's some master plan here. Yeah. yeah, but yeah what yeah. I'm saying is we have to be. Um, we have to be conscious of not letting the technology and the capabilities of the technology get away from us and not marry up what the unintended consequences are with that. And what I'm seeing in my um, various activities is that you are seeing a compartmentalization between the folks that are really, really tech savvy, really cutting edge with the technology piece of it, and and the governance uh, around that, and how does how would that play out in society? Okay. Yeah. yeah and this yeah. is what my concern is. But one last thing I will say um, with regards to AI, I was recently at a meeting where Tom Alube, whom is a internationally recognized. Um, AI specialist expert. Uh, he owns a cybersecurity firm here in the UK. And the way he described it, the question was, will AI change our world? Will AI, how will it affect us? Will it, similar to your comments? And he explained it such as this. He said, if you look at, if you think about electricity, it is just here. It's a part of our everyday life. We don't really think about it. it it's part of us, right? Uh, it's everyday occurrence. And he posits that as we go along, okay, it's not going to be immediate, but as we go further along the spectrum, AI will be the algorithm, the things that you're talking about will just be a part of our everyday it's life. And yeah. so the change, my view is that I do not believe, I really do not believe that robots and technology, AI, will take over the world. What I believe is that we will begin to live amongst them. And there will be certain things in a work environment, in a uh, healthcare environment, and whatever, that, that, they, that the AI will do. And then there will be certain things that we as humans will do. I believe that there will be, that we will learn to interact. Coexist. And, to coexist. Yeah. That is my belief. Fine. Rather than like some superhuman new top of the food chain. That is, that is my belief. Yeah, but, yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. That's interesting. And then, and just moving on to, like, I guess, humans. So, you know, if we've been living for a while, we have to adapt to this new yeah. thing. I mean, if you're born now, I mean, it's just, that's how it is, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's interesting. Do you, do you, what skills do you think, people are going to need moving forward in the next even five or 10 years. If they've, if they've used to, you know, working for the last 20 or 30, right. it's quite a, the pace is, is, is incredible. It's very, it's going to be different. Um, I believe that one of the main skills that people are going to need is just to be adaptable, quite frankly. Yeah. yeah. Um, meaning that, and, and also there was a book that was written by um, the London Business School, two academics there, Linda Gratton and Andrew Scott, and the book's called The 100-Year Life. And basically, long story short, what we're accustomed to has been you go to university, you, you finish school, you get a job, you work, and then you retire, okay? Uh, if we're living <laughs> for 100 years, I think, yeah. I think we pretty much said, okay, we, we're going to live to 100, hey, <laughs> um, what are you going to do? Okay, and so the point is, what you're seeing already, uh, and actually, I'm a, an example of this, you know, you finish university, you work in corporate environment, you have these careers, and then you come to a point where you retire, you are 
restructured, whatever. <laughs> and then you find yourself, okay, so what do I do now? Um, and what a lot of people are doing um, is going back and retooling. Yeah, so you're yeah. going back to university, you're learning something new, which may be totally different from what your career was. And then you go out and you continue to work in an advisory role, in a consultancy role. Um, you know, we talk about the gig economy. I think yeah, that's a yeah. misnomer because most people think of the gig economy as the delivery or the Uber driver. The gig economy is actually people that are working on a part-time basis in interim basis because they are not working in permanent roles as we would know um, with the benefits and all of the things um, that we traditionally looked at. So the point is that going forward, we will be working longer, um, I believe, and um, we will have better physical, mental uh, capabilities, which will allow us to do that. And so the skill sets will be, you will continue on but you will need to to learn and to adapt to always the changes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um I, I, I completely agree i've read the book it's awesome um but i just put the make the point that if you're fortunate enough to be able to afford to go back and retrain because obviously you know a lot of the big social problems nowadays are i mean look, everyone's got more wealthy that's mm -hmm. you know undisputable but there's still a big gap between Correct. you know the haves the have nots and and you know if you happen to be born in a a low socioeconomic background or you know you're just doing a low paid job i mean you know we're gonna have to work or quite people hard that to... have had very good paying jobs however they come upon uh you know various uh issues that may have caused them to fall out of yeah, the, yeah. the um hard you know, times this the, the um i guess you say income the work uh, the workforce or, yeah. yeah and and so those are tough too you yeah. Know? And um, it is a situation where we're seeing more and more inequality. At the same time, people are more wealthier globally than they ever have been. Yeah. And yeah. in better health, actually, yes. than they yeah. ever have been. So it is um, it is a tough thing. And I think I know where you're going with this is, uh, so you could say, well, Tanji, if you're saying that probably people will have two or three different careers, um, work in the the new businesses that are starting up or actually you're seeing the model where there are a couple of founders that put the money in or have the idea to start the operation and then everyone that works for them are considered contractors or it's not a traditional yeah it's very different right yeah uh, people want to work flexibly people don't want to work um you know maybe seven days a week they want to work when they need cash for yeah. something you yeah. know so you have different patterns that are uh, come into the fore from a work perspective that and what people expect of work that will change things. But also what happens is, is that that permanent role that, you know, I work for this company for 20 or 30 years, I'm paying into a pension, I'm, um, I have health benefits and things of that nature. You will not necessarily have those type benefits in the work um if you go with the work scheme that I've just uh, articulated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then the question becomes, well, how do I um, manage to live a life that is, uh, you know, sustainable, that will provide my basic needs and things of that nature if I'm not necessarily in one of those more traditional work settings? And so then the question becomes, well, is there something around, uh, you know, mandatory um, pensions, insurance, uh are you expecting the government to actually be the safety net for some people to about a living wage or whatever? It, exactly. Yeah. I mean, so these are bigger questions than, than I can answer, but I do say that you're right. If people are working, say someone coming out of university now, they are doing a lot of part-time work. They're doing project work, whatever. They'll have to work um, for 70 years. They'll have to work for 70 whatever. years. And how much money are they able to put aside for when, uh, you know, perhaps they're not able to work or they're yeah, more yeah. elderly. Yeah. Um, so these are things that, that well, really doing a bigger low, question. Yeah, huge. And if you're yeah. doing a low paid job, I mean, you're not going to ever tough. be able to. Yeah, retire. it's tough, really. Yeah. Um, and so there's some thought about smart cities. Is there, for instance, in the UK, there is a huge concentration of people in London, you know, um, yeah. the London bubble, if you will. 
But with technology, is there something to be said about having um, offshoots um, of various businesses, perhaps, that may actually allow someone to live in some of the areas of the country that are not... Uh, maybe have have as much employment or yeah, yeah. not as expensive to, to live in not yeah. as expensive to live in right um but people of course then from a social perspective maybe they wouldn't be able to go out and party every night like they can in london but yeah. you know you can't do but they'll be doing it online instead on the virtual reality yeah 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 you know put on my goggles hey i'm hanging out at the net go on yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> amazing well, I think it's a great place to end. I think we've probably agreed that we can't even imagine what the next five or ten years is going to look Ever, like. Yes, <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you again. And yeah, thank you. thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. Awesome. Hey, folks, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places. Bye.